The Resurrection Experiment So the year is 1932 and you have Robert Cornish, the mad scientist who really wanted to bring the dead back to life. This guy was so talented that he already got his PhD at 22, but what was missing from his life was apparently zombies. So he did what any proper crazy scientist with too much intelligence and time on their hands would do. He went full Frankenstein and designed a machine that basically looked like a seesaw and placed the corpse on them. And to make it even crazier, he was injecting these bodies with a cocktail of drugs to thin the blood while also pumping oxygen into them. He then rocked the seesaw like he was giving the corpse the ride of its afterlife. Or trying to, at least. Well, that didn't work. You'd think at some point he might have realized he was just giving these corpses a good shake and not much else, but no, he doubled down. But this time he decided to practice on dogs first instead of dead people. So he grabbed five dogs and got to work and sadly they all died except for two. In some way the two did actually come back to life, except there was a tiny little problem. They were blind, brain damaged, and didn't last long. It's not exactly a roaring success, but hey, it's more than he managed with the human. So naturally, he decided it was time to go back to reviving people. It was around this time a man named Thomas McGonagall was about to be put to death for killing his girlfriend, and Robert thought practicing his resurrection miracle on a freshly deceased corpse could be the key. So he asked the police to give him the fresh corpse once the man was dead. The police weren't exactly thrilled by the idea, and here's why. If Robert did manage to bring McGonagall back to life, the guy would legally be free because, well, he was already executed once, and even the law draws the line at killing someone twice for the same crime. After that, Robert kind of put his resurrection dreams on hold. The Vipholm Experiment It's 1945 in Sweden, and in the city of Lund, there's a psychiatric hospital called Vipholm. But this isn't any hospital. Nope, this one's specifically for patients with intellectual disabilities, and their ability to think and reason is significantly impaired. One fine day, many researchers show up with a sweet tooth and a questionable plan. They're curious about cavities, like what's really causing everyone's teeth to rot. Instead of just brushing and flossing like regular people, they decide to use 660 patients as human guinea pigs for their sweet experiment. The idea was to feed them tons of sweets between meals, chocolates, toffees, caramels, you name it, but it wasn't about making the patients happy, they just wanted to see how sugar affected teeth. And guess what? After all those sweet snacks, the patient's teeth became a dental apocalypse. It wasn't just one or two cavities. Some patients had full-blown tooth decay that left them looking like they'd been chewing rocks. Well, shockingly, they found out that sugar really does rot your teeth because the bacteria in your mouth have a field day with sugar, turning it into acid that eats away at your enamel like a kid with a popsicle on a hot day. Of course, the entire experiment caused a public uproar because it was beyond unethical. The patients at Vipholm weren't able to give consent, and many didn't even understand what was happening. The treatment of mental illness. Now, this particular one definitely has to be rage bait at this point because a doctor named Henry Cotton thought that bad teeth caused mental illness. Yes, you heard that right, teeth. Of everything this guy could come up with, honestly, he chooses teeth. Henry Cotton was a psychiatrist back in 1907, and while most doctors were prescribing bed rest and questionable tonics, Cotton had a more uh, hands-on approach. Cotton worked at Trenton State Hospital, which was a mental health facility, but let's just say his approach to mental health was less about therapy and more about dental extractions. He came up with the genius idea that mental illness was caused by infections lurking in the body, and in his mind, the best place to start looking was in patients' mouths. So he basically whipped out the pliers and started pulling teeth. Now, if pulling teeth didn't cure the patient, Cotton wasn't one to give up easily. If your mental illness persisted, he'd move Move on to more creative extractions like removing your tonsils and sinuses. And if that didn't work, Cotton was like, well, it must be the intestines, because apparently nothing screams mental health like yanking out a chunk of someone's digestive system. Uh, eventually, a psychologist named Philip Greenacre heard about Cotton's high success rate and thought something's not 
not adding up here. So she visited the hospital and discovered a terrifying toothless army of patients and dug deeper. It turns out that Cotton's 85% cure rate was about as real as that of the Tooth Fairy. Most of his patients were still unwell, those who survived anyway. Cotton's extreme surgeries had killed many, and the ones labeled as cured were barely hanging on. Thankfully, the evil tooth doctor passed away from a heart attack, and afterward, everyone collectively agreed that his methods were not something anyone should ever try again. Operation Sea Spray The year is 1950 in San Francisco Bay. It's a regular day. Meanwhile, like some mad scientist, the US Navy is out there spraying a fine mist of bacteria over the city. Think of it as the government's twisted version of Febreze, but instead of freshening up the place, they're dosing the entire population with bacteria. And the stupid reason behind this rubbish was because there was a Cold War paranoia happening. The US government was basically worried that the Soviet Union might attack using biological weapons. So they decided to purposely spray bacteria on a whole city to see what would happen if the Soviet Union decided to attack. So they released Serratia marquesans and Bacillus globigii, two types of bacteria they believed to be the most harmless at the time. Spoiler alert, they weren't harmless, and they spread very fast. So without telling the public, because who needs consent when you're doing science, they let loose these bacteria in a massive cloud that spread through San Francisco like confetti at a parade, and nearly 800,000 people got sprayed with these bacteria. Now, everything seemed to be going fine, no one was growing a second head at least, until an elderly man named Edward Nevin, who'd recently undergone surgery, developed a severe infection. And the culprit was Serratia marquesans. Edward didn't make it, and suddenly people started connecting the dots between the Navy's experiment and several other cases of serious illness in the city. After some intensive investigation and raised eyebrows, the public found out that they had essentially been part of a giant bacterial science fair project without signing up for it. And as you can imagine, they weren't exactly thrilled. The craziest part is that this wasn't just a one-time thing. From 1950 to 1975, the US government ran multiple tests like this on unsuspecting populations. It's like they couldn't resist seeing how far they could push the whole germ warfare experiment idea. Even if the intentions were good, people weren't too pleased about finding out they'd been turned into walking petri dishes. The poison experiment. So just imagine you were a prisoner in Soviet Russia in the early 20th century. Things are bad enough because you've got cold nights, miserable food, and a general vibe that would make a Monday morning feel like a holiday. However, your situation is about to become way worse because you are literally about to star in a top secret science experiment that is honestly short of diabolical and cruel. So the thing is, around 1921, the Soviet Union set up camps known as gulags, and prisoners, regardless of gender, were often given a new kind of meal service garnished with a heavy dose of fatal poison. The twisted idea behind purposely feeding people poison was to create a toxin that was odorless, tasteless, and completely undetectable after the victim's death. So a mad biochemist named Rory Maneri got to work. This guy was cooking up toxic concoctions using substances such as ricin, cyanide, curare, digitoxin, and mustard gas, and then putting them in the prisoner's meals to see if they would be detected detectable after death. Well, they were actually successful because they finally created their dream toxin, a little thing they named C2. C2 was the poison equivalent of a ninja. It was silent, subtle, and deadly. If you were poisoned with this, you first feel a strange calmness, maybe like you were on a peaceful vacation, followed by slight body contractions, and you just die in 15 minutes. And to add insult to fatal injury, it was almost as if the poison had a sense of humor because it gave you a false sense of peace right before game over. The syphilis experiment. So picture this, it's 1932 and a group of black men in Alabama were just minding their own business when some government officials roll up offering free healthcare. Sounds great, right? Free stuff, who could resist? Well, turns out this wasn't your regular checkup and flu shot deal, no, no. What these folks actually got was a front row seat to the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, one of the most infamous and unethical human experiments in history. 
Mercury. Now, syphilis is like that guest who shows up uninvited and refuses to leave, only it's way worse because it can eventually lead to death. But the craziest part is, these poor guys had no clue they had syphilis. The health officials told them they had bad blood. Yeah, bad blood, as if that vague diagnosis would clear things up. And the whole free healthcare thing was a setup to study how syphilis progressed without treatment. Let that sink in, without treatment. The pills these guys were given were about as useful as handing someone a spoonful of water to put out a fire. These researchers were so dedicated to their little study that they let the experiment run for 40 years. That's right. What was supposed to last six months went on for four decades, spanning multiple U.S. presidencies. Over 600 men were monitored like lab rats, with 399 of them infected with syphilis and left untreated while the disease slowly ate away at their health. The worst part is that the researchers didn't even have the decency to give them penicillin when it became the standard treatment for syphilis in the 1940s. Instead, they let the disease run wild to see what happens. Well, they got their wish because about 100 of the men died from syphilis and many others passed it on to their families, causing even more unnecessary suffering. But there's more, because in Guatemala, another group of researchers started another horrific experiment, which was to inject people with syphilis. In 1946, about 1,300 people, mostly soldiers, were injected with syphilis, gonorrhea, or cancroid. And in case you're wondering if anyone signed up for this voluntarily, they didn't. The plan was to inject these diseases, let them simmer for a bit, and then try to treat them. This turned into an absolute disaster, leaving about 700 of those people untreated. Nazino Island. Nazino Island, often called Cannibal Island, is one of the Soviet Union's most horrific and forgotten nightmares. This wasn't just a tragic mishap in history, it was a monstrous experiment gone horribly wrong under Stalin's brutal regime designed to turn uninhabited areas into agricultural hotspots. But it ended up being a living hell where the line between humanity and savagery blurred and broke. In May 1933, 6,700 people were dumped on Nazino Island, a swampy, remote piece of land in the heart of Siberia. These weren't hardened criminals or political dissidents. They were ordinary people rounded up for things like not having proper papers or being homeless. Many had committed petty crimes or simply had the bad luck of crossing Soviet bureaucracy. The idea was simple and utterly insane. Transport these undesirables to a barren wasteland, give them nothing but sacks of flour, and somehow expect them to turn the island into a farming paradise. Well, you can agree that Stalin was out of his freaking mind. On arrival, the prisoners weren't given farming tools or instructions. Hell, they weren't even given proper shelter. They were handed raw sacks of flour with no way to cook it. No ovens, no pots, nothing but their desperation. People started eating flour straight out of the bags or mixing it with filthy river water and, well, this resulted in violent bouts of diarrhea, dysentery, and disease began to sweep through the starving population. Imagine being surrounded by miles of icy water and and cold winds tearing through your bones while your stomach ties itself into a knot from uncooked flour. The island descended into chaos as hunger gnawed away at whatever humanity was left. Armed guards stood watch, not to help or protect, but to prevent anyone from escaping this living tomb. Escapees were shot on sight, bodies left to rot in the mud. Soon enough, small gangs started to form and prey on the weak because when it comes down to situations like this, it is always survival of the fittest. Well, when there was no food left, they turned on each other, and what followed was a descent into cannibalism. Not just for survival, but in an organized, systematic way. People were hunted, butchered, and eaten. Stories emerged of prisoners waiting for others to die, their bodies carved up in the dead of night. Some people didn't even wait for death, attacking and killing the weakest just to stay alive for another day. Eyewitnesses later reported women being tied to trees, tortured, and dismembered 
dismembered, their flesh consumed by fellow prisoners who had completely lost their minds to starvation. Over 4,000 people perished in the span of a few weeks. Some succumbed to the bitter cold or disease, but a terrifying number fell victim to murder and cannibalism. The Soviet authorities, as they often did, tried to bury the truth, but the stench of death and decay was too much even for them to ignore. When the experiment was deemed a colossal failure, the survivors, those who hadn't already turned into monsters, were evacuated. Thank <laughs> you.